how long does the uh, rip the uh, migrant present? Um, does that bullseye stick around till it's been treated? No. Um, curiously, the erythema migrants will go away even without treatment. Uh, it will go away quicker with treatment. Uh, but in the early days of, 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 of the, doing the history, the natural history of this lesion, it will go away by itself. How many days? I don't know. I mean, I think it probably varies quite a bit, but uh, th that's the historical fact. You wouldn't have it for months and months on end? No, I wouldn't know if it was months, no. And the other one, real quick, is uh, the neuroborreliosis <laughs> and the arthritic. Can they, pre can they all present, or would you just have like an arthritic um, showing of it, or would it just be neurological? Or uh, You can have either or both, jointly or not jointly. Um, you put down white mice, uh, field mice, as a reservoir for the, for the pathogens. Um, so it, it would make sense to do what is possible to reduce the field mouse population. I'm thinking uh, about bird feeders and what the relationship is between spilt seed and mouse population. You know, I don't know about bird feeders, but I have one in my house. And I, I have actually never seen uh, rodents in my bird feeder. Many, many years ago, I saw a rat. Uh, however, I, a caveat, I only look at my bird feeder during the day. So everything that falls down on the ground, maybe, and, and maybe you make a hugely important point. I, but truthfully, I don't know the answer. Uh, there have been attempts at reduction of rodents. Uh, and it's questionable whether it's actually worked. And then there's some serious environmental concerns about uh, pesticides in the environment. There used to be a product which was, was really cool. It, it, you would put a cylinder of cotton balls that were impregnated with, with insecticide out in the field. And the mice would like this cotton for their nest. So they would take the cotton and they would lie on the cotton, and the cotton impregnated with a pesticide would kill the ticks. And this product was actually tested and sold commercially. Uh, but it got taken off the market because of uh, environmental concerns. And it appeared that it did work. Uh, you said some percentage of people resolved without antibiotics. Do you know what that percentage is? No, because I think you can do that experiment. Uh, you have to go back to the old literature uh, that, that would actually tell you about this. And I, I don't know the percentage of that. Uh, having said that, I mean, let's face it, why would you not have antibiotic? So, I mean, if I was a patient of Lyme disease, I would run to the doctor and get the antibiotic as quickly as I could. I have two questions. Um, you touched on the fact that there used to be um, a vaccine disease, and now there isn't one, but we have them for, for dogs, for our animals. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance of a vaccine coming through? That's, yes. The question is, was there, there was a vaccine for people, and this was the OSPE vaccine. Uh, it was a, um, a strange way of vaccinating, and I will tell you quickly why that is. OSPE is what we call an antigen that is uh, expressed in the tick form of the organism. So when the organism is injected into a person, the organism does no longer expresses OSPE. So the, we never see OSPE in its native form. So what this, what this preparation was aiming to do was to give us OSPE, have us develop antibodies to OSPE, so when a tick fed on us, the antibodies that we made to the vaccine would kill the spirochete and the tick we got. Twisted way of getting some vaccination done. Nonetheless, the basis of the vaccine, even though it was strange, uh, it, it seemed to have worked. And there were two studies that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine back to back that um, that, uh, that bore this out. 
the reasons for removal of the vaccine uh, from the market were never made very clear to me. Uh, I, I think there were some economic issues. A number of people were not using it, were not taking it. There was some, some, some fear that the vaccine may be causing some auto reactivity down the road, uh, but it got taken off the market and it has not come back into the market in that or any other form. The, uh, there is a vaccine for dogs and uh, that's called a Bacterin. And what this is, is that they take the Borrelia, they actually put it in a wearing blender, they go and then this is what you get. There's no way that the FDA would ever approve that for people. It's good for a dog, it's good for horses, not for us. Uh, and it works. It works. It, it has almost completely wiped out canine Lyme disease in, in endemic areas. Another question I have is uh, with regard to the neuroborreliosis, or, or um, how long do, let's say, the, the peripheral neuropathy, how long would that last? Is it forever? Is there any further treatment for that? Or um, is it just something that we have to I believe that untreated, it gets worse. But I think I am going to defer that question to an old friend. Uh, and you might kill me, Alan. But he, he would know to answer that question better than me. Uh, would, you, would you care to try it, or, or, or you just want to tell me? Certainly, uh, we see peripheral neuropathies and mononeuritis with Lyme that have spontaneously clear. Again, before we knew about Borrelia burgdorferi and Lyme. So we know that the body can sometimes handle it. On the other hand, if I had neuropathy or saw someone who had it and knew they were infected with Lyme, I think you said it eloquently, you'd run and get antibiotics uh, to kill the, the organism. Uh, what, we, what we don't know is the actual what's called pathogenesis of how the infection triggers arthritis or triggers some of the neurologic, whether it's peripheral neuropathy or the central nervous system. Uh, we, we do know, someone had asked the question, kind of the natural history. When Alan Steer, who was a rheumatologist like myself, was up at Yale as a, finishing his fellowship in rheumatology, working for the CDC, he went to a PTA meeting in Lyme, Connecticut, and was astounded that he was actually called there, uh, basically because uh, children were showing up in different pediatricians' offices with swollen joints. And uh, rheumatologists will say, listen, there's lots of transient swelling of the joints uh, in kids, and you need persistent swelling to have juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. We now call it juvenile inflammatory arthritis for six weeks. But I have yet to meet a parent, and as a parent of three grown children, grandfather, uh, et cetera, I don't know of anyone who's going to wait six weeks before seeking medical attention. It's usually the moment you see the swollen joint. And we still don't know. We know there's some DNA sometimes in the joints. We know that sometimes you can detect with different techniques, uh, such as uh, polymerase chain reaction fragments. But not, but the, as you pointed out, Dr. Banash so eloquently pointed out, the culturing is a challenge. And usually we don't get this culture out of joint fluid or out of nerve tissue, uh, et cetera. We do know that with many other neuropathies that, that can occur, like low vitamin B12, you treat with replacement of a nutritional deficiency and you'll see improvement, but you may see partial improvement. Sometimes there's some permanent damage, if you will, that doesn't, it seems to linger. It doesn't mean it's active B12 level going on. And the same thing with Lyme disease. We've seen people go into complete remission and do beautifully, and then others who seem to get uh, partially better 
maybe completely better and then tend to relapse. But we just don't know enough about whether retreating them uh, with antibiotics, are we killing live organisms? Is there already an autoimmune <coughs> reaction that's set up? And it may be because uh, in different individuals genetically predisposed that uh, the pathogenesis is, is very slight. I don't know if that kind of, that's a long way of saying I don't know the answer. <laughs> and but no, I don't think anyone knows. Dr. Banash, uh, Jill Auerbach, and I've been very involved in um, what can we do in the environment to protect ourselves. So the tubes you were talking about are Daminex tubes, and I do believe they're still being produced. I know that the CDC is still currently is testing them now. Um, I know there has been loads of research that has conflicted whether it works or whether it doesn't. And it may well have to do with what else is in the local ecology that the mice might prefer as um, nest materials. So that's still open, but I do know people who swear by it, and it's very simple. It's cotton impregnated with permethrin, and they take it to the nest, and it basically kills the ticks on the, on the mice. And therefore, you know, mice are very territorial. So they're going to be living in around your property and not, you know, stray very far. And getting rid of the mice, they're just going to be others that move in to take over. So um, it more has to do with the um, with whether or not there's great acorn crop or how much food there is for the mice as to what's going to be the population. About the vaccine, um, Dutchess County was very involved with the vaccine trials, and um, I was tangentially involved that patients were calling me when they had terrible problems. And I would tell them to call the vaccine, to get in touch and report it to the vaccine anniversary, um, the AERS system. But um, what was happening is that the efficacy was about 78%, so leaving about 22% of the people not protected, which is really not that great for a vaccine. Uh, additionally, the, um, the immunity didn't last, so that people had to be retreated with a booster a year. Um, and about 30% of the human population contained a similar gene sequence to the OSPE vaccine, to the OSPE. And um, therefore, um, rheumatologists who were on, you know, like uh, Dr. Weinstein, um, Alan Weinstein said to me, no, Arthur R. Weinstein said to me, Jill, we're, what we're concerned about is not necessarily the first vaccination, but maybe repeated ones that it could increase the chance of autoimmune disease. So I think then, then uh, Smith Klein Beecham ended up getting sued by some patients, class action suit, and uh, they just discontinued the vaccine. Um, I might add that we're, um, it's much more complicated now. It isn't just Lyme disease. There's babesiosis, there's um, anaplasmosis, there's Powassan encephalitis. We need a vaccine to do something about the ability of ticks to be able to pass pathogens to us, and that's my speech. Is there any correlation between uh, populations of deer, uh, up to Hudson especially, and the increase in Lyme disease in the Hudson area? It seems like they're going together. I, 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 let me get back to you in a minute. Uh, anecdotally, I think this is true, and I think there's people that are doing a lot of ecological work on deer in, 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 in parts of Dutchess County. Um, the one clear feature is that deer being the main host of the tick, uh, it's very unlikely that you would have this huge expansion without at least a high or increasingly higher population of deer. Having said that, there are Dutchess County natives here that might want to weigh in on that. We had a conference in Dutchess County a little over a decade ago, and one of the presentations was the New York State Department of Health, and they had charts that looked just like yours, and what he showed was the migratory path of birds. So the small animals, which like mice, which had ticks on them, were dragged up eventually through the Hudson Valley into the Mohawk Valley, and right behind them was the spread of Lyme disease. So the deer only play roles, Dr. Tanash, like we said before, in the number of ticks, not the disease. My name is Nicole Rendezzo. I live in Nassau County. 
I am a Lyme patient, and I also am a Lyme advocate and help run a Lyme disease support group called Lyla. Uh, it we usually out of Lyme Town. What advice do you have for patients who, in my case, I was been at 10 years old, uh, it was about 1980, went undiagnosed for 25 years, and then got bit a second time when I was on Fire Island and didn't have a bullseye rash, didn't have 90% of what you said, well, the tick wasn't on me for more than eight hours, but within four months, I got so sick and was testing negative, and then it took me two years to find a doctor, and when I found a doctor, they didn't take insurance. Yeah, I, <coughs> I, I have heard, we have heard, I think we've all have heard your story many times. And you, you have an additional bad situation here that you were one of the very early cases. And you have to understand that we know a lot more about this thing now than we did when you first came down with it. So I think that may be partially what is at, at play here. H having said that, uh, I don't know that there's any specific specialty that is associated medically with Lyme disease. I think that dealing with Lyme disease as a clinical entity and treating it, I think it's well within what you would expect of most internal medicine doctors in, 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 in Suffolk or Nassau County for that matter. Uh, I think maybe that's, that's something that you may need to consider. Um, so who should consider? Well, the, as a patient you should consider because I, I think that, I mean, not all doctors are created equal. Uh, and some of them might be able to give you uh, some, some better, at least some better understanding of what you have. I mean, you have had Lyme disease untreated for so many years. You probably have damage that may never come back to be them that were normal. I was treated for three years, and I treated Bartonella, Babesia, and Lyme disease, and no thanks to the ITSA, I did get 95% better, and it's five years later, and I'm still 95% better. So when is the ITSA going to change their guidelines past early Lyme disease, and that there is no treatment for anybody who has late Lyme disease? She's referring to the IDSCA, that's the Infectious Diseases Society of America. Uh, they have a very comprehensive a uh, set of recommendations for treatment of Lyme disease. Uh, in fact, they've added now additional treatment for some of the other allied infections uh, as well. Uh, when they're going to change, your question is, when are they going to change to a larger amount of time of treatment? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I mean, I, I really couldn't answer that for you. Even after the second tick bite, it was two years post tick bite that I was able to find a doctor. I went to over 20 doctors in, in Long Island and, and Queens and the boroughs, and not one of them would treat me because I had a negative Lyme test. So it wasn't that I didn't have Lyme disease, I just wasn't producing the antibodies for the Lyme disease and the Bartonella and the Babesia that 12 months after taking antibiotics, I finally had an, an immune response. I only got better after taking antimalarias with the antibiotics and treating for almost three years. So the IDSA's guidelines basically say it's the most you're going to give a patient is 28 days. And we were at a presentation that Dottweiler did for Stony Brook doctors and said, if you give a patient more than 30 days, they don't have Lyme disease. And if, and if, they, do have Lyme, if they do have something that looks like Lyme disease, make sure you but you make another diagnosis. And I was there, and I spoke to Dr. Marla too, because I was, I was horrified at what I was hearing. So I'm not, I'm not sure how many people here have Lyme disease. I mean, I don't know if anybody's willing to like, I mean, I know well, here with the group. How many people, how many people, people have here have it? And, and, I'm, and I believe in this, in this, in Suffolk County, it seems like by the time you're out of high school, you probably already have Lyme disease. Because how many people raise their hands when they got tick bites, and more than one tick bite? And nobody knows it. Nobody on Suffolk County knows that that Lyme, Connecticut is not that far away, and that Lyme, like Connecticut understands, but it seems like Suffolk County, Nassau County, they just don't, 
They, 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 they attribute all the diseases and all the conditions that people have to something else. And it's, and it's really scary. And as a blind advocate, I really feel like something more has to be done. And you know, it's time to basically turn the tables and, and, and be there for patients and you know, do something for people. Well, it's like two children who have congenital Lyme disease, and they're not even admitting that's possible. You mentioned it was just a deer tick. So, you know, it, a tick has multiple germs. It doesn't have to be on for 36 hours. That's the, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. I mean, I know the science might show, but. Another question, maybe we can yeah. save this discussion for afterwards because there's other people with questions. Okay, thank you. Fair enough. I think, I think we all know what you're saying, and I think the questions that you have are very complex, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think I can answer them for you. I had a statistic that was out there, perhaps you could comment on it, and that is that 2% of tick bites, deer tick bites, result in Lyme disease. So there's, um, there's probably quite a bit of statistical uh, variation that goes along with that statistic. Maybe you could comment on that. Yeah, it's the the question is two percent of all tick bites result in 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 an actual clinical Lyme disease. Uh, yes, there, there's those papers are, are out there. <coughs> they were mostly from the Westchester County Medical Center group. I'm very familiar with those papers. Uh, this this is a uniquely difficult study to do because it requires that you put yourself at risk of, you know, in order to get that data, we gotta put a tick on you that may or may not be infected. Uh, and legally, and at some level of, uh, of institutional review boards for human subjects research, uh, that's a tough one to do. Uh, a lot of the basis of, of, their, of their findings also are, are accompanied by animal experiment studies. Are they readily translatable to humans? I would say very largely they're parallel, but I don't know that you can draw 100% conclusions from what you do in animals to what you do in people. So the 2% was a figure that was sort of developed so that you would know when people would come to the office of a doctor and say, I was bitten by a tick and demand an antibiotic, and say, well, go slow. You may not need it. And this was the figure that was largely developed around, 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 around this. Having said that, there are prophylactic dosages for, for, for Lyme disease that are out in the literature, and they mostly deal with one single dose of doxycycline. Uh, thank you. I just had a question about the diagnosis. Um, I didn't really touch on it, but ELISA and Western blots, they're kind of time consuming. Are you aware of anything on the horizon that gives a somewhat of a quicker response? No. The two tier uh, test is what you're referring to, which is first you do an ELISA, which tells you how much antibody there is. And then you do the Western blot, which tells you. It's, it's not quantitative, but it tells you what antigens specifically are you responding to. Some antigens are more important than others. So it's a dual, dual two-tier test. It's, it's actually the same test that, that we do for HIV uh, for a number of other diseases. Uh, the idea, like I said, would be to take a sample of your blood, put it in culture, and have an answer for you as a patient in three days or two days. Barring that, anything else that comes along, it's going to take time because it's antibody based. So I don't think there are. There's PCR that actually can do, uh, that, that, that can be done and turn over quicker than, 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 than obviously culture. And also perhaps, although not necessarily quicker than the two tier test. That tells you that you have Borrelia DNA, but doesn't tell you anything about the condition of the Borrelia that uh, that, that they're finding in, 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 in your system. So it can give you a partial answer, but not the entire answer. So right now, I think the two tier remains probably the gold standard. Yeah, I just ask, I'm uh, actually a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, so frequently I do get kids coming into the office with a swollen knee, and uh, a lot of times their clinical presentation is very similar to like a staph infection of the knee, which kids can get acute hematogenous septic arthritis, and that's more of a true surgical emergency. So you get these kids that are walking into the office, that's usually not 
a bad, hot joint. Um, already last month, I diagnosed two of the kids with uh, Lyme, but the, the test, uh, if there's any way you can come up with something quicker, we'd love it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I actually have two questions. One is very simple and quick, and the other may be a little bit more complex. And that is, besides mice, uh, can the small mammal be a squirrel or a budget mice? Because those are only my bird feeders. And then the other question is, um, when, if you have Lyme, if you've had it, I did have it, I don't think I do anymore. Uh, can you get it again? I mean, we're talking about a vaccine. And um, what is the immune response uh, to the uh, spirochete? Is it more permanent in nature or just temporary? I, I can answer your first question very quickly. Yes, there are other, there are other rodents that can carry the Borrelia. In fact, uh, shrews are very good about carrying Borrelia as well. And they do get ticks. Uh, there are studies that implicate squirrels, chipmunks, uh, voles. Uh, although those are less. Now, the second question, let me see if I understood you right. You said you had Lyme disease, and you would want to know if you were vaccinated, what would happen? Uh, do you develop immunity to the Borrelia? Yes, and a very qualified yes. Uh, Lyme disease, it's a long disease. You can have relapses of arthritis without treatment. And this is the hallmark of the disease. Does that mean that this is a separate avenue of pathogenesis, like make maybe something like an autoreactive disorder that's working here, or is this incomplete immunity? So without a great deal of conviction, and I stress without a great deal of conviction, I will say that there is an immune response to Lyme disease. How thorough it is, I think, depends on the actual person. I would say most people develop a very strong immune response, and that's the end of that. Then there's a number of people where you see the relapses, the remission and the relapses. And I don't think anybody has an answer for that. Paul, oh, I wanted to ask regarding um, prevention of the spread of Lyme disease. Is there any way we can go back to using DEET attached to uh, deer feeders or attach DEET to, to bird feeders to, to help prevent the spread of Lyme disease? Sure, the DEET is a repellent. And, and yes, you can use it liberally on you and on, on surfaces. Uh, I think that's, that's part of the, uh, part of the uh, you know, part of the arsenal that you have against these things. Because I remember back in the day, they had a uh, huge, uh, they had deed sprayed onto deer feeders, and it would rub onto the deer, and it would prevent the... the... No, that's not deed. That's, that's actually an insecticide. And these are the four posts, and this is a clever way in which you get, you put in a, a, a bucket of corn in the middle of this contraption. And as the name implies, it has four posters and a gate. And the gate is such that when a deer moves through the gate, there's some rolls that are impregnated with insecticide. So when the deer goes in to get the corn, the insecticide, um, you know, latches on, well, latches on. I mean, it permeates the, the, the deer fur. Uh, they have been used in Long Island and elsewhere. They are thought to be very effective. Uh, however, again, there are environmental issues that, that are associated with this. Namely, the first one is that they attract other animals, uh, mostly rats and other rodents. And, and, and the dosage of the drums with the insecticide is made for deer. But you could have other animals that are going through that that could, getting, could be getting a much higher dose of insecticide than it's environmentally desirable. So, I mean, there's no perfect cure here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Dr. Kamal.